Distributed systems are collections of computer programs that work together to do some larger task. If you've used a computer or a phone in the last 20 years, you've probably used distributed systems and not even realized it. Unless you work on them, you probably have no idea just how complex and how amazingly intricate distributed systems are. Today we're going to spend some time talking about what it takes to put together a distributed system, and in particular what it takes to make sure that it's working and to troubleshoot it when something goes wrong. Hi, I'm John Miller, the Deliberate Engineer. I've been programming for 40 years and I've spent the last 30 years working mostly in big tech at companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle, Google, and so on. Today I'm going to give you another in a long series of cautionary tales and lessons that I've learned throughout the years working in industry. Hopefully by the end of it you'll have an example of uh, how things can be really difficult to debug and how to avoid having to deal with that yourself as you move forward to working in distributed systems. In the intro, I mentioned you're already using distributed systems today without even knowing it. Now, uh, there's a lot of them, but I'll just name two of them, DNS and BGP. DNS stands for the Domain Name System. That is a system of servers and data files that allow you to type in something friendly like youtube.com and have that translated into an IP address that your computer can use to connect up to that service. Now, DNS, you might think it would just go from your computer to one spot to change that name, but in fact, there's thousands upon thousands of DNS servers out there, each of them responsible for a different tiny part of the namespace. And it takes many of these servers running together to answer a single query and to give an authoritative IP address back. If any of those servers are misconfigured, you can wind up breaking name resolution for large swaths of the internet. BGP is a route propagation protocol. In other words, it gives information to networks of how they can route data that they want to send to a remote server closer to that server. Typically, when you take a piece of data on the internet from your web browser, from any other application, email server, and so on, and send it someplace, you're not actually just sending it directly to that endpoint. That's an abstraction to make it easier for the programmer to use the network. Instead, what happens is the information travels to a router, and that router looks at its configuration as, oh, uh, I see from the IP address that I should send it to this particular connection. And it does that, and that connection does a similar lookup. You can wind up going through dozens of routers before you reach the final destination for the message. The way that these routers know where to send the packet is this, uh, this route data that gets propagated through BGP or, or OSPF or RIP or some other router protocol. These are typically manually created files because there's business logic that goes into deciding which way to send packets based on where they came from and where you're at. So it's not as simple as just having a single global map. Plus, you need to be able to uh, survive and still route data to endpoints when some of your preferred route is down. So all of this means that there's complex configuration files that get created and maintained by humans, sometimes with tools, and when any of those screw up, you can bet that there's going to be an internet outage. It might just be for one company or a few names, or it could be for a whole swath of the internet. I think we've all seen news articles about Netflix going down or Amazon going down. Lots of times the reasons for those failures are failures in either DNS or uh, one of the routing protocols or both. Now, those big internet protocols aren't the only examples of distributed systems out there. In fact, if you use Amazon.com or Facebook or Google or uh, Twitter or TikTok, any of these applications, it's not just a web server you go to, it's actually an incredibly complicated distributed system that relies on many other distributed systems to do its work. These systems are usually put together by specialized software engineers and network engineers. For example, when I was working at Amazon, I worked on the, the Kindle and Fire backend services. In other words, the internet services that allowed those devices and applications to run seamlessly and look like they had easy access to download software, download books, or what have you. All that required a large number of services working together to get the job done. These systems allow companies to deliver services and software that just couldn't be done any other way. The scale's too large. Now, having said that, it takes an awful lot of work from an awful lot of talented people to keep those services up and running and to safely improve them. Amazon is rightly proud of the service-oriented architecture, SOA, that they pioneered as they were splitting up their Amazon website from a monolithic application to 
to a distributed application. Now, the way that the system has been put together, there's a large number of services and you can compose new services out of those plus a little more logic. It makes it incredibly easy to deliver a new service, but the downside is it lets you rush something out there before you've really put a lot of thought into figuring out whether it's going to be diagnosable, maintainable, extensible, and all those things. So it comes with responsibility for the developer who has to do a good job of making sure that their system is sustainable as a service. One of the first areas where these services often display problems is in debugability. In other words, being able to take a look at a failure that's reported for an end user of the service and determine what led to it and how to correct it so that future users don't bump into it. I remember a case where my team, the, the Kindle backend services team, had a problem where some transactions were failing on the first time. There was enough redundancy and retries built into the system that it would automatically retry and then it would usually succeed on the second try. So it didn't result in an outage for the customers, but it did result in inefficiency. And it's something that eventually got raised as a problem that we had to diagnose and fix to make sure that our system would remain scalable and uh, snappy in terms of response time for the customers. The top tier of our service was responsible for accepting requests and then handing back responses for that. Now, we had too much traffic to run on a single server, so what we actually had was a fleet of servers that were running. And then a given client that came in would be assigned to one of those servers in the fleet and have their transaction taken care of and then the result returned to them. So the first step in our diagnosing it was to try and figure out which of the fleet the request had gone to and see if we could re retrieve the logs for that request. This wound up being trickier than you might think. Now at a given time, if you know enough about the service, you can figure out which of the servers is going to receive a request from a particular user. But if the request happened sometime in the past, like the previous day, as it did in this case, then the number of servers that are running and which servers are running and which servers are responsible for which users, all that can change. And that was our case. So what we had to do instead was find out the state of the overall services the day before and take a look at all of the servers that have been running as part of it and search all of those to see if any of them had the logs. Now, the logs could have been lost at this point because sometimes those recycled servers get reformatted. But in this case, we were actually able to find the particular server that had the logs and start looking at them. As we dug into those logs, we were able to follow uh, different tracing that was in place for the service. And one of the first things that it did was it called out to a second service to get some work done. Uh, for example, it might have been a storage service or some sort of intermediary for a storage service. So the call out to that failed. Great. Well, we just need to track that down and, and figure out why that failed then. Well, not so fast, because the information that we'd used to track down this particular call in our top level service was a user ID or a customer ID and a little bit of other information. That data wasn't transferred down to the next level in the call chain. Instead, there were a different set of parameters that were passed in. Those parameters weren't typically logged because it's just too much data. So really, the only thing we had to go from was a timestamp. So we do the same sort of thing that we did with our service. We look at this uh, service that we were relying on and look at all the calls that were made and say uh, a 30 second window. Now you have to have a window because different servers can have their time slightly off. Typically it's only a second or two, but it can be 30 seconds in some reasonable cases. So we had to look at a large swath of transactions. And in this case, it was literally thousands of different calls of the type we were trying to debug. So how do we find out which one of those is the one that we need? In this case, what we had to do, since we didn't have any common data between the two, and since the parameters to the dependent service weren't logged, we went back to the source code for the uh, original top-level service that we owned and looked and tried to figure out, well, what sort of parameters would it have passed? You know, is there any data? We found enough information that we were able to narrow it down and find the right call in this first-level dependency service. So yay, we, you know. From that point, we have a, a, a transaction ID in that service that we can trace down that service and find out, oh, oh, it called out to a third service. And we have to do that same exercise again. Now, sooner or later, you're gonna start bumping into services that aren't owned by your team and they aren't owned by anybody near your team. Now you have to create a ticket and go talk to a different team somewhere else in Amazon and get them on the phone and get them to agree to spend time helping you troubleshoot this thing, telling you how to identify which call it is and talking sort of apples and oranges to each other until you have enough common information and context that they can find what you're looking for and give you back the, uh, the error code that comes back from it. And that 
typically adds several more hours to the debugging. So by this point in the scenario that I mentioned, we probably spent six or eight hours debugging and we're still no closer to finding this problem other than saying, well, we're looking at one of the first failures. You know, for all we know, that failure could have been an expected failure. So the error code that comes back is like, oh, yeah, they didn't save any context. Now go ahead and create a context next. So it, it can be just awful. What you really need in these situations is some sort of a globally unique identifier for a transaction. And you need that to be passed down through all the child services that you call. So for example, you wouldn't just have the user ID, you would also have a transaction ID at the top level. And then that transaction ID would be logged along with the call out uh, from the top level service. And when it arrives at the second service down, that service would be responsible for accepting that transaction ID, logging it and associating it with any local transactional ID it has. And then logging a line about, you know, a request received and another one when the response comes back, you know, sort of summarizing that. And that makes it much easier to debug. In that case, if all the different services have this globally unique ID that's associated with the single callout, then using tools that you would commonly find in a big organization like Amazon or, or Azure or so on, you can actually just search for that particular good and get all the log lines that talk about it. And that will give you the sequence of calls and the, the set of all the services that were addressed. And then based on that, you can take a look, see if something looks suspicious and dig down on a particular service at that point. You can eliminate a, a false negative or a false positive for a failure in the order of five or 10 minutes rather than taking an entire day of your time and several hours of lots of other people's time. So it's really a good way to go. So again, the, the most important thing have a way to correlate the different activities on behalf of a single call coming in. Even if you need to drill down into some related service that has a problem, knowing the exact global unique ID that you can look for makes it much easier for whoever you're talking to to look up the relevant data and you don't have to try and come at some common understanding of how everything works in the end. You just say, well, this is a good and I know it made a call and the call came back, failed at about this time, what can you tell me about it? And that's a much quicker uh, problem for them to answer as well. Anyway, we were able to solve our problem and figure out what was going wrong and eventually to correct it. Now the question is, what are a set of best practices that we can take away from this awful lesson that I learned? First, you wanna have some sort of a globally unique identifier that's attached to all the operations that are done on your behalf. Second, you want to be careful about how you decompose work. So in a SOA world, you might just go crazy and have a bunch of different services you call that are each doing just a handful of work. You really want to have lower granularity than that. It's a lot better to have four services you call rather than 40. It just reduces the amount of work that goes into troubleshooting. It reduces the amount of network overhead, authentication, everything else associated with it. So decompose your task sensibly for the distributed service. It'll be less work to debug that coupled with the GUIs will make your life much easier. There's a lot more things and a lot more infrastructure that you can do to make a distributed service debuggable, but this is probably the biggest single lesson I learned. And you know, it's one that I unfortunately learned a couple of different times at a couple of different places. So don't be like me, don't keep making this mistake. Make sure you have a globally unique ID, make sure you have an easy way to retrieve logs based on that ID, uh, and make sure that you don't have too many constituent services that you're relying on. How does this compare to your experience working on a distributed system? Do you have any other tricks or tips that you might recommend for folks? Uh, is there anything that I said that you disagree with? I'd love to hear more about it in the comments down below. Also, if you enjoyed the video and you'd like to see more information like it, please leave a like and uh, subscribe. That'll show me that this is something people are interested in and I'll keep making more of it. Thanks a lot for making it this far and keep on pushing forward. Hi, this is John. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please think about subscribing so you get notified of my future videos. Also, if you are interested, you might want to check out the video I have linked here. Thanks and keep on pushing forward.